Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our panel discussion uh, this afternoon. I'm really delighted that you've come, and it's a very gripping subject. Um, to introduce myself first, uh, my name is Charles Clark. Uh, I was in the British government, though not in any foreign policy role, but with Professor Brendan Sims, who's lurking at the back there, uh, we jointly founded the Baltic Geopolitics Programme uh, nearly two years ago, uh, which has uh, developed a, a great deal of interest. We've been very pleased with the discussions we've had on a wide range of different subjects. Our panel discussion this evening is going to be led by Edward Lucas on my left. Edward, many of you will have come across as a very distinguished journalist on these subjects, with a particular experience of knowledge of the Baltic Sea region. In his earlier life, he was involved in founding publications uh, in the Baltic states. He's a columnist for the Times, and except for his uh, psychological weakness, which is to be a member of the Liberal Democrats, uh, he's uh, very, very authoritative, and we're really delighted that you're here today, uh, Edward. The origin here is that he wrote with General Ben Hodges uh, a report called Close to the Wind for the Centre for European Policy Analysis, which sought to analyse this. And when I saw the report, I think having a serious discussion about it is a very worthwhile thing to do. And I can't think of anybody better to be the serious discussion part of this than Sir Stuart Peach, who you see on the screen in front of me. His programme evolved today, so he has to join us online. But we're very grateful to you for giving us the time today to be able to participate in this event. He's a former Chief of the Defence Staff and Chairman of the Military Committee of NATO, so has immense experience of the issues of NATO coordination, collaboration, uh, at both a military but also at a political level as well. And so I've asked uh, Stu to comment on the main points that Ed is going to make. So how I'm proposing to operate is to ask Edward to speak for about 10 minutes to introduce his report and its central conclusions. Uh, we summarised some of the points on the web page about this event, but I'm then going to ask you if he would be ready to respond and give a commentary with his, his experience on what uh, Edward has, has, has had to say. And then I'll move to discussion uh, in the wider group as a whole. I should just say we are recording this. It's not going out live, but it will go on our website soon. So please be aware that uh, any comments you make are rec recorded. Uh, we found that there's a big interest. In fact, particularly for this event, we had a lot of people saying to us they couldn't meet, be here this evening for whatever reason, but they were very keen to see uh, the discussion. So we're glad to put that up. So, Edward, I'm going to kick off. Uh, as I say, your report was called Close to the Wind. Could you summarise what essentially you were trying to convey by the work you did on this report? Right, well, thanks very much, Charles, and it's wonderful to see so many distinguished faces in the audience. I feel we could rotate the panel into the audience several times over, and um, many people here do just as good a good, good job as us. Uh, a, a couple of words of background, first of all. I first went to the Baltic States in um, no January 1990, and I have spent really the rest of my life either living there or doing things um, involving chiefly their security. And I have been always very struck by the simple clarity of the Baltic States' own view of their position in the world and what needs to be done, and the enormous muddle and moral cowardice coming from, almost, and from, from the West and the menace coming from the East. I think it's well worth remembering that um, in 1993, Lennart Merry, then the Estonian president, gave a speech in Hamburg of crystalline uh, clarity and prescience, warning about the threat from Russia. And this was uh, greeted with some dismay and indeed um, crossness by the Russian delegation, which got up and stormed out of the Matthäussuppe, which was the festive occasion where Leonard Mary was speaking. I wonder if anyone in the audience knows who the leader of the Russian delegation was who slammed the door so demonstratively as they walked out. It was indeed Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, who in those days was just a humble 
corrupt official, to quote Casablanca, in the St. Petersburg Foreign Relations Department, um, the municipality. And so this actually goes back a long way as far as the Baltic states are concerned. But what was really strong, and, and as far as Russia was concerned, and I was there when we had um, all sorts of mischief and mayhem, we had mutinies um, inspired by Russia in the armed forces of both Estonia and Lithuania. We had the um, far-right uh, group in Latvia, which was being run by the KGB, trying to tar Latvia with the Nazi, um, the, the Nazi brush. We had the um, repeated use of energy sanctions. We had the, really the whole cocktail of hybrid warfare, um, which, as we now call it, um, economic pressure, information warfare, and so on, all being deployed against these countries at a time when they were much weaker than they were now. And I remember um, actually being in the room where officials from these countries would say to Western decision makers in, you know, from Brussels, Washington, Berlin, I'm afraid to say even London, and were basically laughed at and told, you are hysterical, you have post-traumatic stress disorder, you don't understand, Russia is now a democracy, it's a market economy, our priority is trade and investment with Russia, please don't rock the boat. And there were years in which even the idea that the Baltic states would ever be allowed to join NATO was regarded as absolutely ridiculous and it was considered provocative even to raise that question. Well, that changed over time and what was originally seen as impossible just became difficult and what became difficult became possible and then it became inevitable and then everybody turned out that they said they'd always been in favour of it, including, I may say, Henry Kissinger, who assured me categorically in 1993 at a conference in Potsdam that the Baltic states were never going to join NATO and the whole idea was stupid and told me at a conference in 2006 that he'd always been in favour of the idea. The great thing about being a journalist, you have notebooks, you write things down, if you index them, you can go back and find the notebook. Um, so they have been basically right and we've been basically wrong and that's the sort of framework. Now I was worried back in 2013, 2014 that the very limited uh, contingency plans we'd made to defend the Baltic states um, after 2008 with the Strasbourg and, and uh, Pre President Barack Obama saying this is ridiculous, we have only three members of NATO that are actually likely to be attacked and they're the only three we don't have contingency plans for. So NATO made, the, made contingency plans and we put sort of the very basics in place and I thought that wasn't really enough. So before the war in Ukraine started in Crimea, I started working on a report called The Coming Storm where I just pointed out, A, that the threat from Russia was palpable, um, that the Baltic states were in no position to defend themselves, and that NATO's reinforcement plans were extremely sketchy, also classified, but thanks to the magic of WikiLeaks, also available to anyone who wants to Google them. And the, uh, we had serious problems of strategic incoherence because of Finland and Sweden not being part um, of the alliance and therefore not part of any common ISR, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance um, approach, also not being part of our defence planning. And so I wrote this report called The Coming Storm, which was um, fairly lurid, but turned out to be absolutely right, I may say. And so I then followed it up um, a few years later with a, a more substantial report, which of course has been completely wrong, um, because this was based on the idea that we don't have Finland and Sweden in the alliance, and that the West is not going to, um, is underestimating the threat from Russia. And very helpfully, uh, Mr. Putin, moving on to his um, subsequent job, has to some extent woken up the West to the fact there is a sort of broad now consensus that we face, even in Germany, astonishing, um, that we face some kind of problem from Russia. And uh, we've also seen, of course, Finland and Sweden, although not actually yet members of NATO, because there are a couple of countries, chiefly Turkey, who are um, trying to extract, extract a bit of a price. Uh, the fundamental strategic incoherence of the region um, is changing. We now have almost everybody in the region is in NATO and in, um, the, in the EU, and the fact that Norway and Iceland are not in the EU doesn't really matter. So this has created the preconditions <coughs> for solving some of the problems we've got in the region, but we, has not actually solved the problems themselves. And I'll just touch very briefly on this because we don't want to get into the um, discussion. The, the first and biggest problem is geography. The Baltic states are not like West Germany, which we were practiced defending, and I'm sure 
um, General Sir Stuart will remember the um, sort of exercises we had in 1983, where enormous numbers of arm armoured vehicles would thunder across very expensive West German farmland, doing enormously destructive and expensive exercises, followed by jeeps, where I think the British officers used to hand out Deutschmarks, the American officers, being a bit more bureaucratic, would write checks, I don't know what the French officers did, um, to very grateful farmers, um, where you calculate you had so many hectares of asparagus, we smashed it up, here's a check, don't complain. Uh, we knocked down a barn and a few hedges, we've done that too. We are not in that position with the Baltic states. We don't have areas in which we can do those sort of exercises, and we don't have the sort of troops to do those sort of exercises. So we cannot do the sort of defence for the Baltic states that we did in West Germany. It's all going to be about the credibility of our deterrent and our ability to reinforce and what we can do on the re resilient side. And all those things are seriously problematic. Um, we don't have um, the military mobility we need across Europe. The um, JSEC in Ulm um, is still not up and running properly. We don't have the sort of picture of um, roads and railways and harbours and all the sort of stuff that we need to move the large quantities of men and equipment, who are mostly men, across Europe in a very short space of time that we would need to do if we were going to do reinforcement. We've got other problems too. We don't have the command structure. The command structure was built in the days when we were still trying to do things that were politically convenient rather than things that made strategic sense. So even when I was researching this with General Hodges, who of course actually is a very far more serious um, military person than um, I am, um, but even people who understand this for a living were struggling to explain the difference between the, 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 the headquarters that's partly in Latvia and partly in Denmark, the headquarters that's in um, Poland, the other bigger headquarters which is in Poland, then there's the um, NATO headquarters and then there's another one in Norfolk but sometimes it rotates to Naples and then of course there's one important headquarters that's really important which is the American headquarters in Poznan with five corps because they're the ones who'd actually do the fighting and it's, all, it's a serious muddle. It's been constructed for political reasons. We don't know, we don't have answers to that. And then there's a huge problem of stocks. We don't have the stocks in the region that we need to fight. And, I and, and obviously most of the people we spoke to are talking off the record, and, but I have heard this again and again. We fight absolutely brilliantly for the first three, four days, and then we run out of everything, and then we just hope that the Americans will be able to help us out. And of course, the main source of helping out from the Americans is that enormous Marine Corps base in Trondheim, huge caverns under the mountains in Norway, hollowed out by slave labourers for the Nazis during the war, and now an extremely important, perhaps possibly even one of the, the most important um, depots of the Americans in, for the Americans in Europe. But the Marine Corps is changing. It's changing to being a coastal raiding force of the Pacific. They're not going to be there to doing heavy lifting in Europe indefinitely. So there's all sorts of problems in, in that sense. There's also the undeniable point, which we see so clearly in Ukraine, that we are strategically naked without the Americans. Everything depends on the Americans. Without the Americans, we are all screwed. Um, we could not be screwed. We are bigger and richer than Russia. And in fact, the nine countries of the Nordic Baltic region, the five Nordics, the three Baltics and Poland together, have a GDP bigger than Russia's, and they have a defence budget which is about half the size of Russia's. And with its defence budget, Russia has to run a Blue Water Navy, a strategic nuclear programme, do military space projects and other things, and those nine countries just have to defend themselves. But of course they spend the money very stupidly, it's all fragmented and we don't do it. So we can solve this, we can cook with what we've got in the kitchen, but we choose not to, so we're hugely dependent on the Americans, and goodness knows what's going to happen um, in two years' time and who the next American president's going to be. So I am both deeply pleased that my report is out of date, deeply pleased with the progress we've made to date, and deeply worried that it is not nearly enough, given the evident menace um, which Russia has demonstrated towards Ukraine, which is quite a hard target, and which it could develop, um, demonstrate towards the Baltic states, who, despite being members of NATO, are a great deal smaller. So on that cheerful note, I shall now look forward to some real expertise from someone who actually knows about this stuff rather than just being a journalist. Edward, thank you very, very much. That's fascinating. Uh, Stuart, uh, Edward has used quite trenchant language in describing his history in this period, and you may well reject some of it or not, I don't know. But I think we'd be very interested to hear what's your take on this kind of account of what's happening and whether you feel, Edward has said, that things have improved significantly recently and, of course, with the uh, decisions of Finland and Sweden to join NATO potentially improves that in the round. But I'd be most interested in your take on both the report itself 
uh, but also the kind of points that uh, Edward has made in his introduction to it. So, Stuart Peach. Uh, thank you, Charles, and thank you, Edward, for that introduction. And there's much with which I agree. And of course, the, the geography is indisputable, and I will come back to that as a constant theme. I think we have underplayed the importance of geography as we have sought the, the, the sort of benefits of technology. And many of the, much of the geography of Europe hasn't really changed since the days of the czars. And many of the policies that uh, President Putin pursues may be actually similar to those of the czars with modern weapons. But I do agree that there, were, there was a, an evolution, I would call it, uh, which followed the period that followed the Cold War. Of course, the, the rather, actually it is quite difficult to put a sort of thread on the journey of expansion uh, through the, the period that all the former Warsaw Pact countries joined NATO. But it was always true, and it's not a correction or a corrective to, to what I've just heard, it was always true that there was a, an understanding of the threat from the East. And that sense of the knowledge of a threat is really important backstop to how the, the Baltic states, who I admire deeply, know well, and I think are wonderful allies, have developed. Now, of course, some of the geography of their infrastructure, which is another important point, run east-west when they could perhaps more usefully run north-south, and that is being corrected over the medium and long term. I strongly agree with Edward on the military mobility point, which I worked very closely with Ben Hodges, Hodges on when he was in uniform, and I worked very closely with the European Union. And one of the things I'd like to say to a group like this is it's very easy for journalists in Brussels to pick at the difficulties and the differences between the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and the European Union in terms of military affairs. And actually it's much more, uh, it sells fewer uh, copies of blogs and the like to talk about the unity or the common purpose. In my experience, actually, particularly on military mobility and other key facets for the future, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and the European Union are aligned. What has happened, of course, is that Russia has invaded Ukraine in a completely illegal war, and not for the first time in history, is prosecuting all forms of warfare, including economic warfare and many other uh, information-based activities, whether they are warfare, but they're certainly misinformation, hybrid, and all the other things. And of course, that has not only revealed itself, but is now at times, frankly, making um, a real mockery of what they are actually doing in terms of legality and all that they are going to reap in the long term. So I think the key point to add to the introduction, Charles, is to say that for me, the unity the Alliance has demonstrated so far as the war has developed, has been extreme, and is really impressive. And that unity continues. The way in which the European Union has sustained its unity and gone about sanctions is really impressive. And even though that may get harder over time, and particularly with energy security, and I think this panel, this group, would be well to pause on the wider consequences of energy security, because of course there's a risk that people look to their own needs rather than the needs of the continent. And then we see the, the consequences in the uh, area around the, the battle zone of food security being weaponized. And of course, it's not new to say that information is, is a new domain of warfare. It's not new at all, but it's certainly true that now we need to put real emphasis and effort and investment in cybersecurity and in information security, which leads me to my big point. 
where I do disagree that NATO didn't have a plan. NATO had a plan. NATO decided early after the, uh, the illegal annexation of Crimea to develop a plan for enhanced forward presence. It's not to me, and it's maybe me peculiar to this audience, uh, it's not a muddle. Enhanced forward presence is a multinational formations in four locations in Poland and the Baltic states, uh, which are commanded and controlled by the framework nation who have agreed to lead. In the case of Estonia, it's the UK. In the case of Latvia, it's um, Canada. And, and in the case of Poland, it's the US with the Poles. And then there's a separate growing multinational formation, both in terms of divisions and a core in Poland, which fit within an Allied Joint Force Command construct, which has been reconfirmed at the NATO summit in Madrid, which then allocates missions and geography to those missions controlled by the operational headquarters at SHAPE. And it's at shape in Mons in Belgium, where the interface between the US forces in Europe, and I agree with Edward, they're very important. And the other allies is then managed, control, commanded and controlled. So it may seem muddled uh, to many, and I can understand a little bit why that might be so. But the most important thing to say to a group like this is, it's not muddled to the soldiers on the ground. And that's important. Where I do agree with, Edward, is so much in warfare is about logistics, so much. And we see the Russians struggling with logistics. We see Ukrainians with shorter lines developing their logistic plans and sustainment. NATO continues to develop both military mobility as a concept and in reality to sustain those efforts, the forward presence will continue to do that work. The JSEC was mentioned. The Joint Support Enabling Command down in Ulm is developing quickly. I've been there many times. It's a good uh, idea. It came out of Germany as part of the reorganization of the command structure of NATO. So where I'd like to close, Charles, before we have a discussion, is on the very fact that NATO has a multinational command structure with a, an authorized commander, the Supreme Allied Commander Europe, who is under political control of the North Atlantic Council, he can allocate forces, missions, time and space through Allied Joint Forces Command, who then, through a, a structure of corps, divisions and brigades, can command and control operations at sea, in the air and on the ground. And that is enabled and supported in NATO by cyber and space. All of that delivers collective defense for a billion people. And that, to me, is a key point of the alliance. It has convening authority. It has survived seven decades. It has managed expansion. It has absorbed many new allies. It has developed its command and control. And it has a command structure which no one else has. Every other organization that conducts military affairs, be they operations or observation or interposition or in the world, so I include the United Nations, the EU and any other organization, they are all ad hoc. NATO has a command and control structure. It has doctrine, tactics, techniques and procedures which create interoperability. And that's what marks it out. And of course, it's easy to criticize a big organization. It's easy to criticize an organization where I know very well how hard it is to achieve consensus on difficult issues. But do you know what? It works. It's an alliance that no nation has ever been forced to join. It's an alliance of sovereign states who come together. And even if in the meetings, which Edward will know well, you will know well, Charles, at the North Atlantic Council, there are differences and arguments. It comes together and creates the necessary consensus. And that's what it's done this year. So I think NATO is really important. I think the interface with the European Union continues to develop. And of course, the longer the war goes on, the more important it is to, to sustain the very unity that NATO and the European Union have demonstrated. So I don't think I'm differing that much, but I'm emphasizing, perhaps in my conclusion, the vital nature of 
international solidarity in the face of Russian aggression. Thank you. Okay. Stuart, thank you very, very much indeed. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to ask one question to both of you, and Edward, if you want to respond to uh, some of what Stuart says in that, you'd be welcome to do so. I'm then going to go to you here in the room here. So if you can be thinking about points that you would like to draw out to Edward and Stuart, uh, I'd appreciate it. Uh, my question actually comes on the back of what Stuart said at the end. Uh, Edward's report said um, that there were particular challenges he identified in differing threat assessments, chiefly at a political level, gaps in intelligence collection, sharing and fusion, and lack of trust among some regional countries. This was the conclusion of your report. And I think that addresses directly the point that Stuart is making there. And I'm going to ask both of you to comment on how difficult you think it is to get this kind of agreement. I was very struck uh, yesterday that Josep Borrell, the uh, high uh, representative of the European Union, in a great lecture to his staff in the European uh, External Affairs Service, criticised them for not being active enough in collecting intelligence about what's going on, and said directly, which I was very struck that he did, that the UK and the US had warned the EU about Putin's intentions in, uh, in <coughs> relation to Ukraine, at the end of 2021, and that he, this is Joseph Burrell speaking on behalf of the EU, had not responded to this intelligence which the UK and US hadn't brought into play. And I just cite it in this, so I think it's a very good illustration of the point that you're making, you, you made, Edward, in the report. Uh, and of course, as it, Stuart rightly says, it's the kind of discussion which goes on the whole time within NATO and also between NATO and the EU. But I just wonder if both of you could comment on this question of getting a shared view of threat and the intelligence systems. But Edward, you obviously wanted well, to that, make a remark or, or yes, so I mean, about what Stuart said as well. Well, well that, that is one of the great benefits of Sweden and Finland joining NATO, is that we start moving towards a much more common uh, threat assessment and much better sharing of in, in intelligence across what was previously quite a big NATO, non-NATO divide. Um, we did a survey where we talked to lots and lots of decision makers and analysts in the region um, from all the different countries and just asked them to rank the other countries um, in terms of how much they thought their own country trusted it. And it's very interesting. We'd done this, uh, the exercise, I think, six years previously, and the po Polish-Lithuanian relations in those days were really pretty bad. They're now, I think, from memory, the best of any, um, any anything except. Can anyone guess which two of those nine countries has the best um, level of trust between them? Five Nordics, three Baltics, and Poland. And there's one that is an absolutely standout, you know, practically married. And it was not one you'd expect. Anyone guess it? Who hasn't read the report? It was Finland, Finland, Estonia. Very interesting. Um, this was at a time when Finland wasn't it wasn't in NATO. Um, so there's a, there's a, there's a but, but, but we also noticed very severe worries in Finland and Sweden, particularly about Poland, and people saying things like, you know, we, we couldn't be in NATO, we, you know, there's no way we would have the main headquarters for this region being in Poland with the Polish general in charge. You know, for F Finland and Sweden, that seemed um, rightly or wrongly uh, a, a very serious obstacle only a year ago. Now, you know, we don't know where the, you know, what will happen with headquarters. Um, I do think there's a... There's, I mean, I very much appreciate um, General uh, Sir Stewart's uh, explanation of how it should work in, in, in theory. Um, there are a couple of trust problems. One is a very big one, is about whether NATO will act in time. And one of the real worries in the Baltic states is of the very quick land grab. And while the North Atlantic Council is trying to ha still trying to hammer out a consensus um, with possibly Hungary or some other country um, you know, leading the resistance, you might have um, Russian troops having already seized a lot of territory. So that puts a huge weight on the um, coalition of the capable, on countries that are willing to act very quickly. That could be the United States. Um, we obviously hope they're not distracted. It could also be this is something where the JEF, the British-led expeditionary force, um, could play a role. But there's a nasty gap between stuff happening and NATO making its decision, which has never really been tested, unfortunately, because NATO has never had um, a war against a peer adversary willing to um, go really quickly. So that's one trust thing. Another is at the level of national decision-making, 
it's still a bit squishy if you imagine that you are attacking Lithuania through Latvia. And from a military point of view in Lithuania, it makes sense to blow up a lot of Latvian bridges. Are you just going to go ahead and do that? Will the, Latvian, the Latvians happy that you're going to do that? Um, what happens? So there's quite a lot of this sort of stuff that is not fully, um, not fully hammered out. Um, I'd also say one final thing, that I really resent um, any suggestion that we've basically got this right. Because if we basically got this right, we wouldn't have tens of thousands of Ukrainians dead and millions of people with their lives shattered. You know, we have to be, I think we have to start off in a position of considerable humility and contrition, because we were warned. We were warned again and again and again. We were warned after the Karaganov Doctrine. We were warned after the cyber attack on Estonia, <coughs> the war in Georgia, the invasion of Crimea. And again and again, we were naive and complacent and, I'm afraid, greedy, and we didn't do what we should have done, and the result is we now face this catastrophe. Okay. Uh, Stuart, what's your <coughs> view of this issue of trying to get to shared threat assessment, <coughs> shared use of intelligence, dealing with uh, mistrust between particular members of the alliance and so on? Could you just talk us through how, how you see that can be dealt with or improved? Well, I've been involved in uh, the transformation, I'd call it, of NATO intelligence for at least 15 years. And the reason I use the word transformation is not to take it from a book. It's to say that I agree with the last point that Edward made, that we do need some contrition. And the reaction after the invasion, the illegal act, activity of Russia in 2008 in, or, in Georgia was, was not well coordinated. I was the chief of defense intelligence in the UK at the time. And I went to the NATO intelligence board and became a big champion for changing the way we did business in intelligence. And I'm pleased to say that uh, along with many other allies, actually, Edward, we, we agreed that we, we had to do better. And that led to the creation of an assistant secretary general for intelligence and the fusion of both the civilian side of NATO and the military side of NATO. And that has stood the alliance in good stead. It's not perfect, but it's better. What is true, though, is NATO intelligence is only as good as the willingness and the ability of allies to share with their alliance. And if they don't share, it's not good. If they do share, it's good. And it was interesting that you, you commented, Charles, and Edward commented on um, the EU. It's not for me to comment on the European Union's um, information activities, but I can honestly say that I have been very pleased with the way in which NATO has taken their intelligence responsibilities seriously, and allies have indeed stepped forward and warned of the Russian consequences, as indeed have, and to use the correct terminology, NATO partners, not yet allies, uh, and I include in that, obviously, Finland and Sweden. So I think trust has developed and it is much better than it was. And of course, trust works at different levels, both with bilateral and multilateral. Edward mentioned the Joint Expeditionary Force that has an intelligence element to it. And there are many other formats in which bilateral relationships make a difference. The other thing that Edward talked about, which I will also agree with, is I've been saying for decades, actually, that time is a serious factor in operations and in war. And therefore, decision making, which must be exercised at the highest level and frequently, needs to take account of time. And in peacetime and in normal be behavior, the North Atlantic Council, good as it is, is doing routine business, referring to capitals and going back again. And what's important about um, the alliance, which is again unique, European Union, United Nations, OSCE, the other organizations in the world don't do it, is that the North Atlantic Council is scalable. You can sit at the North Atlantic Council in a high speed, high stress environment, in a secure environment, and by that I mean information secure, and make decisions at the speed that's necessary. 
And then you can scale it up and down to the gravity of the situation, to the head of state if necessary, because that's the nature of the Washington Treaty. And the thing I'll close on, noting we're in Cambridge, is actually it does nobody any harm, me included, to occasionally look, glance back at the Washington Treaty. It, doesn't, it takes about seven or eight minutes to read it. It was written in 1949, and my word, it's a good document. And it has been stood the test of time and is still very relevant today. So those founding fathers in 1949 had the wisdom, faced with the threat of Russia, to create a treaty in case. And that's the important point about our alliance. Thanks. Thank you, Stuart. Now, as I said, I'm now turning to the audience and looking for people who'd like to ask Stuart and Ed questions. Now, can I see some uh, indications? OK, I've got a number of people. That's excellent. I think I'll take them in ones rather than in groups of three, actually, because uh, I, I think just allowing the discussion to develop would be worthwhile. So can you just identify yourself before asking the question? Okay, my name is uh, Tom Burrows. I'm here doing MPhil in politics and international um, studies, but I'm also a serving officer in the, um, in the Royal Navy. Um, my question is, given the lessons that um, the Russian Federation Armed Forces are learning in Ukraine at the moment, which is a country that is probably more um, geographically suitable for tank warfare, um, etc., um, do you think it's conceivable that the uh, Russian Federation could take any direct conventional action against the Baltic states without employing tactical nuclear weapons, given the strategic depth that NATO has and the fact that any incursion onto NATO territory is is a de facto triggering of Article 5, particularly seeing as given, um, just seeing it as a single axis co conflict for a minute, um, the, the right flank, as Russia would see it, is now got a greater NATO pre presence up in the Arctic. Um, to, to be clear, you're asking the question not in general, but in the particular circumstances that we have now of the conflict in the Ukraine taking place. I think given the, the assumption, rightly or wrongly, that the Russian armed forces will be learning lessons from the experiences in Ukraine at the moment. Stuart, do you, would you like to kick off uh, on that one? I think Article 5 is very clear, and the uh, allies at Madrid and subsequently the Secretary General and other heads of state meetings have made clear that Article 5 is uh, <coughs> on their mind. I, I don't think I quite see it that way at the tactical level. And it's not, uh, we're, we're not in a place to discuss the tactical situation. But I also think it is worth reminding ourselves that NATO is a nuclear alliance with a nuclear deterrent. And of course, that deterrent is linked to the Washington Treaty. Again, so I'm sort of repeating myself slightly. But I think Article 5 is the bedrock of collective security. Rather than get drawn into a sort of a hypothetical discussion about <laughs> what could or might happen. And of course, there's then the other side of the coin, it goes back to the Edwards points on intelligence, is to understand as clearly as possible through indicators and warnings, and that's the, it's not jargon, it's the right phrase, uh, what the Russians are actually up to. And that is a key task. Thank you, Edward. Yeah, I mean, Article 5 is... It's, it's quite rare people read it closely, I'm afraid. And it starts off, it's absolutely wonderful, an armed attack um, against one or more of them shall be considered an attack against them all. That's great, three musketeers stuff, all, all for one, one for all. And then there's the word consequently, which does an awful lot of work in the, what follows, because it's not completely consequent, that if such an attack occurs, um, the, um, they will assist the parties or parties so attacked by taking forthwith, individually and in concert with other parties, such, such action as it deems necessary, including the use of armed force. So it doesn't say, we will go to war on your behalf. It says, we will take such action as we deem necessary. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of wiggle room, to be honest, in Article 5. And what's great is you can react extremely forcefully, and you could, and under Article 5, the United States could immediately go into absolutely full-scale war to defend... Um, even the smallest and weakest member of NATO, and it could do so even if nobody else um, was to um, come along with them. So it's, it's very permissive, um, but it, it doesn't actually mandate a specific response. So it's well worth looking at it. And I'd also very much 
commend, if you've got a spare minute or two, to look at some of the ar other articles. Um, article 3 is my favourite. That's the sort of person, you know, it's a bit like being a train spotter, which is your favourite article of the Atlantic, uh, um, of, of, of the Atlantic Charter. Um, so I, I think that the, the, the key thing in all this is to have a really credible deterrent. Because once you're trying to reverse a Russian land grab, you've already lost, actually. Um, there's going to be enormous pressure um, not to go, you know, who are we really going to threaten Russia with nuclear weapons in order to get back bits of the Baltic states? And there's going to be a lot of people saying, hang on a moment. I'd also say that the Russian military is so degraded um, with the result of what they've been doing in Ukraine, it's going to be a while. We've, we've now got time. The Ukrainians, through their blood and sacrifice, have bought us time to get our defence in order. So let's not, let's not waste that. And I think there's then there's sort of three things. There's, there's the really increasing the, the resilience of the Baltic states, get, getting our to finish levels. And they're already pretty good um, because if you're immune to the sort of information attacks, the, high, the economic pressure, the subversion, um, all the other sort of things that, um, that, that, that Russia is quite good at, that already weakens you. Um, we need to have a really credible sort of porcupine defence in the Baltic states, which we're moving towards, and that's very good, and with very good early reinforcement, so before we need it, that we're putting um, uh, forces in, and we need to have um, regular, really good exercises, which we absolutely don't have at the moment. We have tightly scripted exercises with very little room for things to go to go wrong. We need to get back to doing exercise. This is Ben Hodges' um, second big point after military mobility. You've got to have exercises where things go wrong because it's from that that you actually learn how to get it right next time um, rather than doing these sort of theatrical ones. And then we've got to be absolutely clear that our escalation ladder is fully, has got every rung it needs. And we're seeing at the moment a bit how our es escalation ladder is not perhaps at the best shape. Russia has really put money and effort into building these, I don't like the phrase tactical nuclear weapons, but small, small yield nuclear weapons that can be delivered um, by artillery shells, depth charges and so on. And we in the pursuit of global zero have been rather cutting back on that. I think there's 60 um, gravity, uh, you know, small yield American gravity bombs in, in, all, in all of Europe. And after that we, we have the Trident um, type strategic stuff. The French are in a slightly different position with their force to flat, which is not necessarily so. Um, so there's a, lot, there's a lot of rethinking we need to do about the big deterrents. I'm not necessarily saying we have to match Russia nuke for nuke, um, but I do think we need to have the um, really, and I wrote about this in the Times on, on, on Monday, really well worked out um, ideas of very painful things that we can do um, very credibly in a way that sends a signal to Russia um, that don't do that again, it's, the next thing's going to hurt you even more. Thank you. Uh, Brendan, next. I've got three or four people I'm observing. I will come to everybody here. Brendan. Brian Brendan, I'm the director of the Centre for Geopolitics. Two really, thank you, very interesting sets of remarks. I've got lots of questions about the last one now. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry about the time. So, the country that wasn't mentioned was Germany. Um, of course, it is the country with the largest economy in the region, um, and one which could uh, make a very much bigger contribution if it chose to. Um, the centre is actually under Charles Leach, is actually going uh, to Berlin uh, on the 14th of November to uh, speak on the subject of cost savings. Um, so, it's interesting for me on. on Thank you, Brendan. So Germany. So first, Edward, then Stu. I, I couldn't hear, uh, Charles, sorry, I could not hear Brendan. Our, the question is, can we trust Germany, um, put bluntly? And I, I have to say, the trust deficit, we didn't measure this because Germany is not part of the Nordic, Polish, Baltic Nine, but there is a massive trust deficit with Germany. Um, I... It's hard to overstate how angry people are with Nord Stream 1, with Nord Stream 2, with the um, German, other German economic ties, with the incredibly patronising approach, um, the, the Orientalist approach that the, Ger the Germans have again and again taken towards their Eastern neighbours. Um, a real feeling that in the end, Germany look, Germany's economic interests are what matters and Germany will put its economic interests 
um, over the security of the other partners. Add to that the slightly artificial but still very unpleasant Polish-German spat, which is really part of the upcoming Polish election campaign. Um, the sometimes less than impressive um, German um, military presence in the um, in the um, in, 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 in the Baltics, which is um, is not quite at the same level as what the Brits are doing in Estonia. Uh, very unfortunate rhetoric from some German politicians. And I'm afraid we've got a very serious problem there. Now, at the moment, you know, the, the sort of NATO lid is put on this can of worms quite firmly, and it may be that with the Zeitenwender that the Germans actually get back in the game. But you know, if you're if you're an Estonian, you've put one percent of your GDP in the last nine months into supporting Ukraine. Estonia has a bigger per capita um, effort for Ukraine than any other country. You've got more refugees, perhaps, per capita in Estonia. You absolutely, all over the Baltic states, you have people feeling this is an absolutely existential threat. And then they see Schultz, and there's this wonderful German word, Schultzen, Schultzing around, not taking it seriously, doing the easy stuff, not doing the difficult stuff, and they feel betrayed. They absolutely feel betrayed, and it's going to take a long time to put that right. Stuart, what uh, Brendan asked, he, he didn't ask the question quite as bluntly as uh, Edward passed it on, but he was saying that uh, this centre, we're having an event on November the 14th uh, in Berlin on the subject of Ostsee Politik, uh, to try, with a, a lot of German politicians and think tankers and so on, to try and understand what are German attitudes. Uh, and uh, he, Brendan was asking the question, what should we be asking and what should we be thinking about? But I, I think Edward was right to sum up that the can we trust Germany was the uh, idea underlying uh, Brendan's question. But we would very interesting to hear your thoughts on this, Stuart. Well, I speak as a former um, and long-term friend of Germany and the Bundeswehr, and I, I don't agree uh, with the premise you can't trust Germany. I think Germany is fully integrated into the alliance. I've witnessed throughout my military career of almost 50 years uh, an absolute commitment to the Bundeswehr with the alliance. It's a different issue is whether German force elements, whether German capabilities have kept pace with modernization and all that may they now meet, may be required to do. And it's also a different case that, of course, other allies, including the UK, have a wide range of operational experience since the 80s, which not all members of the Bundeswehr may have had because of their they haven't been involved in all these uh, expeditionary operations. But nonetheless, the Bundeswehr is modernizing. And of course, the German government has committed to increase defense spending. And I would also point out to the audience uh, in readiness for your event, Charles, that actually throughout the time of the alliance's evolution, Germany has committed and assigned its forces into NATO. I think it would be wrong for me, certainly, to comment on German-Polish bilateral relations. They're always going to be um, affected and indeed influenced by the history they're always going to be affected, indeed, influenced by perception. And I've witnessed that in uniform over many decades, and particularly as a four star for many years. So I, I don't want to wade into that. But I would say that, remember my clarion call to the group earlier. We need to sustain the unity of our alliance in order to deliver collective security to that one billion people. And in that role, in that guise, Germany remains a vital ally and a very strong uh, power at the heart of Europe. And even if Germany is reluctant to exercise its military might or reluctant to lead in command and control terms, the, the Bundeswehr should not be underestimated, is my summary point. Thank you. That's a very interesting round of thoughts. Gentlemen there. Uh, yes, you, sir. Yes, um, thinking about Ukraine, to what extent... Sorry. Hello. Yeah, thinking about Ukraine and the Russian attitude of Lugansk and Donetsk, to what extent do you think this idea of protecting of so-called Russian-speaking people could extend into the Baltic states? 
The second point I've got really is how do you see the role, given that it's got um, joint borders with the Baltic states, the potential role of Belarus and the possible movement of Russian troops into Belarus? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Edward first and then Mr. H hands up everyone here who speaks Russian, apart from me. Okay, two. Um, you and I are not a political category. In fact, we speak Russian. And I, I guess everybody here speaks English. If you don't, you're not in the... You're, you're not. Being, speaking English isn't a political category. Speaking French isn't a political category. Um, what Russia did after 1993 with the Karaganov Doctrine was to create a category unknown in international law of Russian speaker. And what Karaganov said is that Russian speakers everywhere in the world, um, that Russia has the right, indeed the duty, to intervene on behalf of Russian speakers. Just imagine if you said England or Britain, the United Kingdom, has the right to intervene in the world on behalf of English speakers. Yeah, we're going to go marching into Quebec because you can't, you know, the French are being beastly to the English there. Or going back, you know, Ireland or India or wherever. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a lunatic idea based on an absolutely unspoken but deeply felt colonial mindset. And I'm, I think I'm, I'm pretty sure that we've now shed that in, in this country. Um, at least I hope so. So I, I really caution against the idea of, of getting into the Russian rhetoric over this. People are people. People speak lots of languages. Um, it's odd for us in monoglot Britain to understand it. But you could, I mean, I have friends where you have mixed marriages. This could be in Ukraine or Baltic States, wherever you speak Russian with your children, Ukrainian with your wife. You speak one language, one lot of grandparents, one with another, one language at work, one language at, work, at, at home. Um, these, are, these are multilingual societies. And the idea that you can sort of make a, a neat division into this is the Russian-speaking part of Latvia is a, is, is, a, is a category mistake, and it's one that Russia wants us to make, because it then creates pretexts for it. Now, there's no doubt there are people in the Baltic states, as, as in Ukraine and indeed in Germany, who have a political and cultural orientation towards Russia, partly um, based on Soviet nostalgia, maybe partly on some other things. Well, that's their choice. In a free society, you could have all sorts of political and cultural orientations. But that doesn't mean that you accept the outside power acting on that and saying that we have some kind of sacred right to intervene. So I am, I think actually the, the uh, story of the Baltic States in the last 30 years has been an enormous success. They were right, we were wrong. We tried to get, turn them into bilingual sort of bicommunal societies like Belgium. And they said, no, we want to get back to what we had before 1939. And that's broadly been a success against the extreme doubt and scepticism of um, many Westerners. Um, so I think good luck to them, and let's not um, let's not try and second guess them. I think on the um, on, on Belarus, on our side, the most fragile country is Moldova. On their side, the most fragile country is, is Belarus. And although it's risky, and I sort of in a way hope it doesn't happen, I think that if Putin tried to bring Belarus into the war, what he might end up doing is losing losing Belarus. I've heard from um, military and other sources in the region that if the Belarusian army is ordered into Ukraine, they will either, they will either mutiny or desert. Um, this is, would be a very big gamble. For, and it seems to me that the fact that they're taking the tanks away from the Belarusian army and giving them to the Russians suggests that they've realized they can't use this. Um, so I would be, um, I, I would, if I was Lukashenko, I'd be booking my winter holiday somewhere sunny. Mm. And Lukashenko, of course, has had a very complicated history in his relationship to Russia throughout his whole period. Uh, Stuart. Uh, thank you. I strongly agree with Edward. It's a very sophisticated answer. The Russification, uh, which is some people call it, is dangerous. And the risk of falling into a trap set by Putin to, uh, as Edward rightly says, to create a pretext. If we could talk about uh, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, we could talk about some of the elements around the, uh, the Caucasus, this is not new, but it doesn't make it any less dangerous. The nostalgia, the influence, I agree with everything Edward said. I mean, it, I would also add, by the way, that there is strange influence in the Balkans. There is strange influence for Russia around the Black Sea. There are strange pockets of minorities that actually, since we're in Cambridge or virtually, 
could go back to discussing the aftermath of the First and the Second World War. So we don't want to fall for this. And it is a trap if we do fall for it. On Belarus, I strongly agree. I think it's very delicate right now. And I think the, the more we could keep Belarus out, the better. Um, as for the tactical situation inside uh, Belarus, it looks, again, as if they're in a very um, uncertain position. And the only thing I would add to this discussion is it isn't just the army I worry about. There are a number of inevitabilities. I don't think um, many in this audience would disagree with me if I said that very few dictators improve with age. And as they get older and more set in their power base, they tend to create mini-me's in all sorts of ways and create Praetorian guards with different titles, which may or not be part of their proper command and control and governance. So it is worth watching, it's worth observing. I don't think it's likely that they're going to add much to the battle, but it is worth noting, but it is very delicate. Excellent. Now, I've, I'm, uh, you're next, sir, but can I just see who, who wants to come in? I've seen two, three. Okay, we've got about half a dozen people who'd like to come in. I'll just come around and try and get all of you in in the I half an hour. I think if we have a question from, the, from someone who's actually from the Baltic States. Yes, the we'll, region. We'll, see, we'll see what we've got on that. But firstly, the gentleman there. Yeah, hello, I'm uh, Wing Commander Jim McPartlin in Royal Air Force. Um, <clears throat> I'm a postgrad student here studying politics and international studies. Um, my, my question is that Putin is, is quite clear that the expansion of NATO represents an existential threat to, to Russia uh, and that any further expansion um, will have repercussions and, and, and indeed is having repercussions now. So my question therefore is, is to what extent you think that um, the expansion of NATO in the 90s uh, has actually caused this situation, has it increased the threat to Russia? So, Stuart, how do you react to the claim by Putin and, and others that it was the NATO expansion which was the cause of these issues? Well, again, we need to be careful we don't fall in a trap on this. I mean, the, the evolution of, of the history of Europe since 1989, there are two versions. There's the, the NATO version agreed by 30 and many more, and then there's the Russian version agreed by a few. And I think that we, we could end a, a very long debate, Charles, if you want, on who said, she said, they said, but if the facts are the facts. And I said, I'll repeat what I said earlier. I don't mind repeating myself occasionally. NATO has never forced anybody to join. I don't think that's true in the case of the behavior of the Russian state. And so I think we need to be really careful about trying to uh, interpret and exploit history for modern day political purposes. Thank can you, I, Edward. Can, yes, I mean, this, this is worth just chewing on a little bit because it is the sort of central Russian grievance. And it's one of those things that makes, it, it all makes complete sense if you don't remember what actually happened at the time. So for people who've got no memory of what happened in 1997, 2002 and so on, and you just look at a map and say, gosh, well, NATO got bigger. And you know, here's this thing where it seems like James Baker promised it wouldn't expand. So clearly, Putin's got a grievance. But I was actually there all through the 90s and all through the noughties. And I remember several things. One, the enormous effort that NATO made to keep Russia on board. We had the NATO-Russia Founding Act. This was laid down in black and white that NATO did not see Russia as an adversary and Russia did not see NATO as an adversary. And in those days, one of the reasons for expanding NATO was to stop the new, it was to, to close down potential conflicts in the region, because people were worried that there might be a blot between Slovakia and Hungary. People were worried about what we'd just seen in Yugoslavia with the, the, the ex-Yugoslav wars. And so joining NATO was seen as a way of nailing things down, getting people into a security structure well before they were going to get into the into the EU. And there was a, I'm not saying everybody in Russia was happy with it, but Russia signed up for this. Russia said, yes, this is okay. And then in 2002, with the second round of expansion, 
we had the Rome summit, um, which I remember very clearly. And there's a document with Putin's signature on it, setting up the NATO-Russia Council, which was going to be taking NATO-Russia cooperation to a new level. NATO was so concerned about Russia and feelings that we said we're going to have no bases, no exercises, no, um, no, no forces in the new member states. And not only that, we will make no contingency plans. We did not. And I remember this because the, the Balts were really nervous and the Poles were really nervous. And the Poles, there was an American contingency plan in the Pentagon, but NATO would not make contingency plans because MC-161, which is the NATO Super Secret Threat Assessment Committee, which is so secret you can Google it, and was explicitly told, do not count Russia as a threat because Russia is a friend. And until you count Russia as a threat, you obviously can't draw up any plans. Um, the Poles, under extreme um, with extreme pressure, we're told we will drop a plan um, based on the idea that you might be invaded by Belarus, a country about one quarter of your size. And that only changed with Obama. And I would say it changed, changed too late. But anyway, um, we were super nice to the Russians and they decided they didn't like it because Putin, for his own regions, needed to manufacture a... He, uh, first of all, he was trying to withstraw... He was running up against NATO as he tried to um, do his... Um, stuff in the near abroad. And secondly, it suited him very much to make NATO into an adversary. And one other thing, when he says NATO came out to Russia's borders, sorry, NATO had borders with the Soviet Union, Norway, Turkey, and in fact, Alaska. Norway's still there, Alaska's still there, Turkey not because the Soviet Union fell apart. So the idea that we crept up somehow on, um, on Russia is nonsense. And the countries ran to NATO and banged on the door basically because they were scared of Russia and they were right to be scared. Bill Clinton wrote an interesting article in The Atlantic about six months ago uh, on just this question as how he saw it at the time. Uh, to answer your question, Edward, Donatus is the next question. We're an authentic Lithuanian bolt. Uh, Donatus, can you, can you just introduce yourself slightly more fully than I've just done? Yeah, so, uh, let me push a little bit on this. Uh, so I'm sure you know realists like uh, John Mer Mersheimer one could even say that there are two poles in, in the whole thinking about this. Yes, uh, so one is, uh, so, so one could say there are two poles of thinking about all this. One is you and another is, the opposite is John Mersheimer and the whole realist school, which is basically blaming the West for everything that, that's happening now and what will happen in the future. Uh, it's true all, uh, it, it's true what you said before that you know the West tried to win over Russia, but realists would reply. But but then you you sort of misunderstood what Ukraine means to Russia, what Ukraine and Belarus means to Russia, because Baltic states was the most that you could squeeze out of temporary weakness of Russia, uh, with Russia agreeing actually to them just just leaving. But Ukraine and Belarus, it was it's like apples and, and, and potatoes. So uh, what would you say to that? And also, do you think there is uh, anything uh, with which you would agree in, in realist thought? In, in when, when you hear, like, you know, your opponents like Mersheimer speaking and, 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 and blaming the West, do, is there anything reasonable in what they say at all? Thank you. Edward and then Stuart. Well, I, I, I slightly hesitate to think that I'm the, you know, John Mearsheimer is one of the most distinguished practitioners of international um, relations in the world. I, I'm not sure I've ever even read a book on IR theory, let alone, I mean, I've read his books, but I, I um, but I, I think I, my fundamental problem with the realist school is it leaves out values. And I grew up in the Cold War and I remember what it was like being, you know, I think communism was evil and it was good that we destroyed it. And I think that Russian imperialism is evil and it's good that we resist it. And so I think that you've got, if, you, if, you start, if you start off from a, a, the idea that you know, big, there's just big countries and small countries and you're basically doing kind of maths about how small countries fit into what big countries want, well, that's fine. But I don't think all big countries are the same. I think that free countries are good and totalitarian countries are bad. And I'm very un unapologetic about that. Um, so, I, for, you know, so I think the realist school is sort of interesting game. Um, but I, I think in real life, is in, in the end, people have... Um, visions for themselves and for what they want for their countries and those things matter. Um, and when I, I wrote an article about this called The Realism We Need, which was in a response to Peter Hitchens's, um, which is a kind of you know, popular version of Mearsheimer, and I said that the, the realism to me is being realistic about Russia. And in the end, 
empires are difficult to live with, and you have, a, you have a choice. You either resist and say, no, you can't do that, or you accommodate them and say you can. And I think the story of the last 30 years is we've, you know, we've resisted Russian imperialism too little at the beginning, a bit more now, and we were right to do it, and we've brought freedom and prosperity to tens of millions of people from the Baltic to the Black Sea to the Adriatic. And if I was going back, I'd do, the same, I'd do exactly the same again, but I'd do it, I'd do it more. Great. Stuart? I didn't... I'm sorry, I, I struggled to hear the question. I didn't hear the question. <laughs> it, it, it essentially, it was about realism, realism and the argument that uh, Russia... That, that NATO behaved incorrectly in relation to Russia uh, in the immediate aftermath of the fall of the uh, Soviet Union. And it was essentially that, and you have to be realistic, and that means you have to accept uh, the... Uh, uh, constraints of not offending Russia, essentially, is what that argument, uh, and you were being asked your response to that. Okay, I think I agree with Edward. I mean, you think we need to be really careful again of this this trap, uh, this this Russian trap of the the sin of the 20th century being the collapse of the Soviet Union. Well, there's a bit more more to it than that. And those um, Warsaw Pact nations, I mean, did they all vote to join the Warsaw Pact? Were were those regimes, were they entirely democratic? Of course not. So I think we need to be really careful. And this is the answer to several comments this afternoon about trying to rewrite history and for the fear of offending Russia. Russia has committed an illegal act. It has invaded Ukraine. Fact. Thank you very much. You, sir. Um, a gentleman at the front I don't here think with that the microphone switched on. Yeah. Is the, is the mic switch, switched on? Hello. Um, my name's Daniel Austin. I'm not affiliated with any academic institution. I did live in the Baltic region, Finland, in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, I read somewhere, um, I think it was in the Times newspaper, that Britain is actually with, with reducing its forces in Estonia, um, which I find in well, I can only assume it's because of uh, the state of the British economy. But as uh, we tighten our belts, how on earth are we going to um, uh, come to the aid of the Baltic states uh, in sufficient time? And uh, my other um, really um, sort of big unknown is I, I discovered during the course of the early days of the Ukrainian war that um, in spite of the fact that East European countries like Poland and the Czech Republic had been in NATO for uh, the best part of two decades or more, um, all their equipment is out of date. They're still using Warsaw Treaty Organization equipment. <laughs> okay, these two, these, this very good question relates to a number of the points from your report, Edward, but I'm going to go to Stuart first. But just to elaborate on the first point, which was the newspaper reports, I think, in the Times, that Britain is withdrawing troops from uh, Estonia later this year. And I, I was in Tallinn last week and talked to a number of people about this, and I can say there is, uh, that those reports raised very sharp worries in Estonia about what was going on. I spoke to our ambassador there, Ross Allen, who's an excellent person, not as excellent as his predecessor, who's in the room, of course, but a uh, really excellent British ambassador, and uh, he said that the core uh, truth of what was happening was we were talking about uh, redeploying in order to be able then to supply troops very rapidly if necessary, uh, if there were a threat that moved right up the agenda. But I thought, think this comes directly to the point that your report made, Edward, and which Stuart made in his talk about military mobility uh, within the NATO framework. So I just wonder if you could both address this military mobility point, which was a specific point you had. And then the second point about uh, another point of the report was the question uh, about how compatible are the, the military, is the military equipment of the various NATO countries even now, even despite long-term membership of NATO in the case of uh, a number of them. So Stuart, could you kick off on those two points and then I'll come, Edward, to you. Well, of course, I'm not in uh, the seat, as it were, so I'm not going to comment on tactical dispositions. You wouldn't expect me to. But there is an ebb and flow to the deployments, and it is about sustaining presence. It doesn't have to be uh, 
always the same numbers and the same capabilities and they they change over time and they will always do that um but i i have a absolute confidence that the nato command structure is managing that and the uk makes its choices with nato the uk doesn't isn't a rogue state in any way it makes its choices by with and through nato the second question is a very good question and in many ways it's a work in progress is the right answer of course the old Russian Warsaw Pact equipment, some of it is still there, not as much as perhaps people think. And many of the uh, Baltic states and other allies have indeed invested heavily, actually, in modernization. But modernization on its own is not enough. It's actually modernization with interoperability, which then adds to the, the ability of NATO to not just have the convening authority, but then execute military operations through multinationality. And that is still a key task. It needs constant attention, in my experience, many years of experience. And you can't just say you've done it and then retreat. You have to keep going and you have to keep doing it. And I strongly agree with my friend Ben Hodges. The other thing that I think Charles is worth saying in the, this is a, length, a lengthy session, I know, but it's also worth saying that we need to train and exercise in realistic conditions and settings. And that includes high level exercises, which Ben and I talk about a lot, but also down in the tactical deployments in, in the Baltic states and elsewhere, NATO continues to train and exercise in case, which is part of active deterrence. And through that process, you generate interoperability between units through experience. So it's getting better. Could it have been quicker? Yes, it could. Thank I, you, Edward. Yes, I, I mean, the MOD answer is that this was a temporary uptick in our presence in the, in the Baltics, which was um, never intended to be permanent. The, the big point, really, is that that is a tripwire force. It's not actually able to fight um, on its own. It doesn't have any air defences. Um, it's naked. We don't have air and missile defence in the Baltic states at all, really. There's a, a, a little bit in Lithuania that the Lithuanians have bought. Um, it's terribly expensive. They're, they're the ones who need it most, and they can't afford it. So one of the big questions for, um, you know, for NATO coming up is someone's got to put expensive, ideally Patriot, something like that, in the Baltic states. And until we do that, nothing we do on the land is going to work. There's also the question of maritime strategy, which we don't have, and where the maritime headquarters is going to be. Um, so but these tripwire forces are great, but they are basically, it's like West Berlin, which um, I remember from the 1980s, where we had British, American, and French brigades in West Berlin, who were, whose job was to sort of you know, die as slowly as possible, perhaps stretching it out to 48 hours, while the West worked out what to do about the Soviet attack on West Berlin. But the, 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 we, we are not in a position actually to, def we, we, you know, even though they've got excellent tanks, we're not in a position to, to you know, on, with, with what we've got there um, to defend them. And then there's also the point, there's no spare parts and there's no ammunition. So it's a, it is, uh, ultimately, it's a kind of token deployment. And it's, yeah, and it's better than nothing, because um, what the Baltic states will say is you want people from countries with nuclear, you want soldiers from many countries as possible, and particularly the ones who have nuclear weapons, um, because that um, raises the threshold considerably. But it is absolutely, if you're actually going to do serious defence, it is not enough. And do you have anything to say on the uh, uh, Warsaw Pact weaponry? Um, I mean, th there's a real problem in... Most NATO countries don't spend nearly enough on modern equipment. Everyone looks at the 2%, which is the sort of threshold, but there's a second threshold, which is what, what chunk of your defence budget do you actually spend on modern equipment? And most NATO countries are rubbish on this. Um, they spend far too much on salaries, far too much on ceremonial, far too much on stuff that's politically um, sensitive, and far too little on buying advanced modern weapons. And that is changing, but it's changing very, very slowly. And the gap between the Americans and everybody else is getting bigger and bigger. We sc frantically scramble to keep up with the Americans, just about manage it, uh, with a bit of sort of um, sticky tape and string in places. But for most European countries, the gap, the gap in, in the sort of you know, question, uh, when it comes to the advanced stuff, is just getting bigger and bigger. Thank you. Gentlemen there.
much. Uh, my name is Brian Trim. I'm uh, the Navy's Mountbatten Fellow here for the year on the MPhil program. Um, uh, my question is regarding the expansion into Sweden and Finland. You've, you've spoken, sir, about uh, that will improve matters from an intelligence sharing, from bringing them into the networks. There are lots of good technical reasons why having Sweden and Finland within the fold will be an improvement for NATO. And yet we've also just unpicked that, that the force within the, the Baltic Three, the EFP force, is, you know, in your words, a, a token force, which I would hasten to add does not mean it is without value. But the difficulty of reinforcing it, of supplying it indeed, is already well recognized, and yet we've just pushed our logistics endpoint a considerable distance further to both the north and east in, in a maritime zone that, that frankly, we are not equipped to contest on an enduring basis. So, so, so my question really is, do the good, does the good outweigh the bad or vice versa in terms of, of that expansion? Edward, perhaps you... Yeah, I mean, I mean if, if you want to get stuff to the Baltic states quickly, it's going to come from Norway, and it has to go across Sweden. It is dramatically easier if Sweden is an NATO member. I mean, the Swedes weren't uncooperative before, but we can now push the Swedes to do what we need them to do to get the um, stuff across central Sweden. Um, and, th yeah, that, that's, and, and the Baltic Sea has become a NATO lake, so that is very much to our advantage. Kaliningrad the Russian, last Russian trophy of World War II, is now a kind of hostage, and we can put pressure on Kaliningrad in a way we couldn't before. Um, so I think this, the whole sea side has become better, assuming we get our maritime strategy. Um, we also have the advantage of Swedish and Finnish air forces, which are excellent, and I would love to see them doing Baltic air, not just air policing, but Baltic air defence. And because basically it's a single operational area. The idea that you've got, you know, the Estonia and Latvia, from a military point of view, and, and Lithuania and the others, they're not separate countries. And the, the poll, we had a great poll who we spoke to off the record for our thing, and he said the outer perimeter of Polish security is the Estonian-Russian border. And that's why we send our coastal batteries up to Estonia on a regular basis, because we need to be able to make sure the Russian fleet can't get out of, um, through the Gulf of Finland, because that directly affects Polish security. So I'm, I'm, I, I see no downside um, to Sweden and Finland being in, only upside. I don't know whether the general agrees with me. Stuart, what do you think about that? <laughs> I didn't get the question, I'm afraid. There's a real uh, echo in the room. Sorry, the, the question essentially was uh, the upsides and downsides of Sweden and Finland joining NATO uh, and how that, should, how that should be seen and assessed. Well, up for NATO, down for Putin, I'd have said. I mean, this is a, a really a strategic ge geographical win for an alliance in terms of contiguity of a geography and all the things that Edward said, with which I completely align. And, and of course, the consequence of the accession through the, the membership action plan of Finland and Sweden into the alliance will dramatically add to NATO's capability in all the areas that we just touched on and some of the areas where NATO has gaps. And so I don't think, I can't imagine that that was an intent for Russia in, in February but it's becoming a reality now. And that's a very powerful change of dynamic in the north of Europe. And of course, I would also add just for the record that, uh, of course, both Finland and Sweden are members of the UK led joint expeditionary force. Thank you. Um, William, can you just introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Um, William Wells from Rothschilds. If I can ask uh, slightly... Um, can you, can, there, there does seem to be something difficulty with the noise. Uh, can you hear me? Noise. Could you just talk a bit louder? <coughs> I think Stuart's having difficulty yeah. hearing. Okay, Will, William Wells from Rothschilds, uh, um, and I, I've just come back from the Baltic States. Um, slightly perversely, if you were advising a current or future Russian government on how to restore its influence in the Baltics, what would you advise them to do? Or have they blown it? Because there's a lot of latent influence there. A lot. Finland, Sweden, the three Baltic states, the big bear Germany. There's a lot there, but it's inactive for now. So what, what would you 
advise a future Rob, Roger Governor? Just to re repeat the question, William's asking you to play the role as a putative advisor to a future Russian government, and how would you advise them, if you wish to do so, to build their influence in the Baltic area uh, on the basis that there is latent support for them? Stuart, have you got any thoughts on that? I, I, I think Russia's behaviour in Ukraine has made it a pariah state. I mean, we've seen every violation of international war that's almost conceivable. We've seen deliberate targeting of civilians, of infrastructure, of, of dangerous forces potentially being um, certainly threatened. And I find it really hard to speculate on how on earth that can be changed now to Russia's advantage and how in a region which throughout history Russia has threatened and occupied, they'd wish some form of restoration. Of course, <laughs> at the same time, I recognize there are Russian minorities and there are Russian speakers, and we've had a brief discussion on that. But I find it very difficult to see how Russia can restore anything if it continues to commit war crimes and egregious acts on the battlefield on a daily basis. Well, let, let, let's imagine that um, my friend Vladimir Karamurza is president of Russia. Imagine the Putin regime goes down in absolute collapse and there's a sort of not a convulsion, a political convulsion, and either he or possibly Alexei Navalny or someone like that is released from prison where they are at the moment. And uh, the, uh, there's, uh, they're, they're voted into office by Russians who say we're fed up with all this imperialist malarkey. It's led only to death and destruction and misery. Let's try something else. So let's take that as, as, as the starting point. And let's also assume that this new Russian government has withdrawn from every square centimetre of Ukrainian territory, has um, conducting extensive war, war crimes trials, not only on its own, but in collaboration with um, international bodies and is paying reparations um, to Ukraine. So let's take that also as a sort of sine qua non. I think at that stage, um, there would be potential for very good relations with the Baltic states. Um, if I was to go to do a to-do list for fixing things, I think that returning the um, property stolen from the Baltic states in 1940, including the Estonian equivalent of the crown jewels, um, would be a very good um, would be a very good start for getting things going with Estonia. There are also similar things with um, Latvia and Lithuania, so the remaining Soviet trophies. I think um, unambiguously recognising that 1940 to 1991 was an occupation, um, dropping any pretense that the three countries joined the Soviet Union um, for anything other than being held at gunpoint. Um, and then there's, a, there's an enormous positive shared history. There's a common love of Russian cultural literature. And I remember my friend Lennart Merry, the late Estonian president, was never happier, actually, when wrestling with the question of Pushkin's imperialism and how one could love Pushkin's poetry when he'd written such awful things about Poland, and he was a, a serious authority on, 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 on other Russian writers as well. So there's a shared cultural heritage. Um, there's a lot of uh, shared ecological interest. There's, a, there's an awful lot in common, but not, it, it would require the sort of turn that Germany took after 1945. But Germany did it, and I think Russia could too, eventually. You know, I mean, if anyone said in 1945 that Germany would be able to be friends with the Netherlands, with uh, France, you know, have diplomatic relations with the State of Israel, this would have seemed absolutely astonishing. You know, Germany did it by plugging away over many decades. So it, it can be done, but it will require a massive sort of psychic convulsion inside Russia. Because unfortunately, to this day, even Russians who oppose the war and I meet them, I'm a political candidate in London, so I'm constantly door knocking, I constantly meet Russians. And I say, what do you think of the war? And they say, I hate the war, because you know, I'm living in London, my credit card doesn't work anymore. And I say, oh, that's terrible. And they say, and they bloody, and they, they use words like hockey for the Ukrainians, this sort of horrible word, which is sort of even somewhere between yokel and redneck. And so you can take, just because Russians are in the opposition, doesn't mean that they've understood that Russian, Russia is an empire and has got to apologise. So they're not post-imperial Russians, they're just anti-Putin Russians. So I'm afraid I think there's a long way to go. OK, we've got about five minutes left. Um, can I see if there are other questions that... Uh, so, um, yes, I've You've got had no two. question to any women I at all that. in the entire time. Uh, two I've got. Over there, first of all, 
And the man, yes, the woman there, the gentleman at the front. Yeah, I do come from Latvia, and I wanted to ask a question about uh, tensions within the country between uh, Latvians and uh, Russian, ethnic Russians, Russian-speaking population. Uh, like the Ukraine, you could say that Latvia could be divided in, in two parts, with this part being uh, largely populated uh, by ethnic Russians and sharing border with Russia. Unlike Ukraine, uh, Latvia has been now over like about 20 years in EU and part of NATO. So uh, recently I have been thinking why so little has been done to integrate the two communities. Um, because the, there has been very little investment into the east part of Latvia. If you go slightly outside of the main town at that district, you will see um, names of the streets in Russian, so they didn't even bother to change um, the name plates into Latvian. Um, after the invasion, they switched off um, all the Russian channels because it poses national security threat. But where have you been on the last 20 years? Why haven't you done uh, pro-Western channels in Russian? And wouldn't that have been a better way of bringing peace and uh, securing um, uh, national interests uh, rather than escalating uh, language reforms? Because from 2025, there will be no education in Russian language in Latvia. Okay, so about relations in Latvia between the Russian-speaking community and the, the absence of action, the questioner says, uh, to try and build strong relationships that could work properly in that area. Edward, would you like to kick off on that? Yes, I was just, check, just checking the numbers. So um, of the um, people in Latvia who identify broadly as Russian, um, 13%, one, one three, um, said they supported Russia. 30% um, said they supported Ukraine. That was in a poll in April, and that had um, changed a bit since the war started. So the pro-Russian or pro-Moscow side had gone, down, had gone down a bit since the war started. Um, in the elections, the Harmony Centre, which was the main supposedly sort of pro-Russia party, explicitly um, condemned Russia's war in Ukraine and suffered quite a lot. They got went below the 5% threshold. And there's been some gro growth in the um, in this um, Roslikovs party. Um, so I suspect you and I are probably the only people in the room who are deeply interested in Latvian politics. So I'll fast forward a bit. So it's it's a sort of a, a slightly complicated picture. Um, but I think that the, the key point is what you put your finger on. It's fundamentally about economics in the end. That the there's been a, a shameful neglect of Eastern Latvia, and it happens that there's a lot of Russians live there. And I go around Eastern Latvia quite a lot, this sort of um, re region, and it, it's, uh, it's, it's sad. And you see people, small towns and villages with very weak public services, schools bad, healthcare is bad, public transport's bad. And it does, it does alienate people. And Riga is disproportionately important in Latvia. It's much, you know, Vilnius is just, it's a big Lithuanian city, but there are other Lithuanian cities that put together are bigger than Vilnius. Tallinn, in, in, even in, in Estonia, Tallinn isn't as proportionately important, but Riga is a sort of, you know, Lat Latvia is almost a, a city-state with a, some bits added on um, elsewhere, because Riga is just so huge and, and, and important. And I think you're absolutely right, there could have been more on the integration front, but I think they should have grasped the nettle earlier. Um, you know, the, 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 the key lesson in this is if you speak absolutely perfect Latvian, you get a really, you're much more likely to get a really good job, perfect written and spoken Latvian. It's the same in Estonia. And if you look at the integration um, polling, people who speak the, the titular language of the country really well do really well professionally. And the worse you speak it, the less well you do. And so I think Latvia made a, a mistake back in the early 90s in not saying, OK, we will teach Russian like we teach French. And you, know, you can make it your main subject at school. And that's fine. Study Dostoevsky and Pushkin and all the rest of it. That's all fine. But you will leave school speaking absolutely excellent Latvian. That is the aim of the school system. And we didn't do that. Um, the, we had this sort of parallel system, which was where, along with education in, in Russian medium, with Russian as the medium of instruction, came a lot of other kind of you know, nonsense, Soviet nostalgia stuff. So I think it's getting better now, but I, I, I'm afraid that the, the, there was um, time was missed in the, in the, in the 90s and noughties. Stuart, <coughs> any comments to make on this?
Yeah, I, I do track, uh, I do, Edward, track uh, recent events as you did, and I share your analysis. I think if I may link the two questions, even if they seem quite uh, separate, I would say we really need to think about reconciliation in a broader sense. And it is, as Edward just said, about the education system, it's about cultural exchange, it's about a whole raft of things and being honest about history. As you well know, Charles, I spend a lot of time in the Balkans and it's quite extraordinary how 27 years after their war, how little has been done on reconciliation. So without wading into debates about the internal business and structures of the Baltic states, Actually, the more you can bring together a common narrative on what has happened and how it happened, and that was ne not easy in the Baltic states after the Soviets left and became Russia, and we now see Russia again. And therefore, all the more need in answer to both questions, regardless of the circumstances now, to not forget to focus on reconciliation. It's so important. Thank you. This gentleman is going to be our last question, uh, and I'm going to say to both of you, when you respond to the question which he's about to ask, if there are any wind-up remarks, Stuart or Edward, that you would like to make about what we've been discussing, please do so. So, so would you like to ask your question? Um, yeah, sure. Hi, my name is Nina. I'm just a, a member of the public. Affiliations. Um, just intrigued talking about the, the Baltic Sea. Uh, uh, AKA the NATO lake. Um, the recent explosion in the Nord Stream gas pipeline intrigued me. Um, who did it? Why would they do it? Um, especially because it's quite hard to find. It's quite a shallow sea, and I gather it's quite hard to do things without being noticed. So I'd just be interested to see the panel's reaction to that. And maybe also um, how they see the, the energy economic law going. To, um, we're switching away from Russian gas, it seems quicker than expected. Is this going to be a real blow to coast conversion, etc.? Okay, two interesting questions. One, uh, what do you think happened to the Nord Stream pipeline? Uh, what do we know? What do we go on? Who's responsible? And so on, which is a big discussion. And then, secondly, the slightly wider question which comes from that how difficult are the energy security issues in the Baltic region? to be dealt with given the, the dependence on Russia. I'm going to ask you, Stuart, to kick off and any response you've got on that, plus any general observations you'd like to make, and then come to Edward to wind us up. Stuart. Well, for those who know Russia well, I don't think anyone who knows Russia well would be surprised of the widening scope of what Russia considers, even though most other nations consider it illegal, to be economic warfare. We've seen the weaponization of energy. It's easy to say that. So what does it look like? Well, it looks like pipelines mysteriously blowing up in international waters, potentially leaking dangerous forces and causing huge potential environmental damage and, and possibly sabotage, to use an old fashioned word, Charles, or other mysterious activities in other countries. So we need to be really careful about attribution we need to be really careful about making allegations, but at the same time, we need to be very vigilant. Vigilant. I am concerned about this in the north of Europe, of, of remote infrastructure being vulnerable to all forms of uh, attack, of underwater warfare is not, it may seem a slightly esoteric subject, or the subject for movies, sadly it's not. And of course, I do not think, uh, as if you won't wish me to move into a summary position, that despite the recent ta tactical successes by the Ukrainian forces, which I celebrate, that we're in a less dangerous phase of this illegal war. And so I think Russia has always done this stuff, whether it's spying, whether it's espionage, whether it's very uh, aggressive activity by the Russian intelligence services, or whether it's illegal activity in other countries. So there's nothing terribly new, but of course the world is interconnected. And I'm afraid, as a second summary point, what may be rational to the 
nationalities in the room is not necessarily rational to the Putin regime and those around him. And so I don't think we're in a less dangerous phase. I think we're in a dangerous phase. I think this conflict could yet surprise us in many ways. And therefore we need to be quick and clear on attribution and what has on what has happened and who is responsible. And that is sometimes easier said than done. I'd also close, given the nature of this discussion being about the Baltic states, on the one hand, we're talking about modernized economies and digital societies. On the other hand, that creates vulnerabilities in the form of cyber and hybrid activity. So this is not over yet, I'm afraid. But thank you for the opportunity. And thank you very much, Stuart. I'll thank you properly in just a second. Edward, your response to these questions and any yeah. more general observations. I think that we are in more danger from the non, from, from conflict below the level of outright war than we are from outright war because over the last 30 years we've systematically signaled to Russia that you, and to, actually to China that you can get away with this stuff. We've had two assassinations in London, neither of which um, provoked anything more than a few expulsions of, of, of Russian spies. We've had a weapons depot blown up in the um, Czech Republic. We've, had, we've actually had assassinations all over the place. We had a kidnapping in Estonia. Uh, we've had uh, repeated cyber attacks, um, some of which are publicly known about, others of which, quite serious, have never come out into the, into the public domain. And at every stage, we worry about attribution. We say we mustn't overreact. Let's not show them they've got, got us worried. Let's be proportionate. Um, as we once saw from a briefing note that someone was carrying into um, Downing Street, this, none of this should affect the city of London. And so we've sent a message that you can get away with this stuff. And yet and they've got away with it again. Now, of course, there's a paradox here. This is their own pipeline. I mean, they built it. It was sending their most important export to their most important customer and um, it was half owned by them and they've blown it up but they've also blown up their reputation as a reliable energy supplier forever this is ending something which started with the soviet union in the 1960s selling gas to europe where the west germans greedy and naive and complacent as always said oh it's just gas and the Americans said, hang on a moment, this is Soviet gas. Do you really want to make your economy dependent on it? And now, as the Germans, horror of horrors, having to have cold showers, turn the lights off in the evening, and uh, their, some of their industries are going to be um, closing down for a bit, they're now realising that actually gas dependency was quite a bad idea. But you might argue that for the last 50-something years, it worked out all right for them. But you know, Russia has destroyed its reputation as a supplier, and it will never get it back not under, you know, in, in, until things uh, change absolutely dramatically. But the funny thing is, I think if Putin was a football team, he'd be Millwall. Nobody likes us and we don't care. Um, this is, yeah, it, it, and, and I think the general was absolutely right in saying, don't uh, apply our sort of rationality to Putin. When I look at Putin, I think of the Sopranos. And when people ask me, how do I understand Russian politics? I don't say read Dostoevsky or any of that sort of stuff. I say, watch the Sopranos, preferably all the episodes. Um, because Putin is basically a mafia boss. And he, you know, he likes to live in a nice house, he cares about his family, he's got you know, some normal reflexes, but in the end he's prone to acts of insane violence and extreme short-sightedness, short, 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 short and he does really, really stupid things. He's got very weak impulse control, as Tony Soprano's psych psychiatrist occasionally tries to explain to him. And, and that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with basically ma you know, gangsters who've taken over a nuclear superpower. And that presents us with very difficult choices. And one of the, getting back to your question, Anastas, is one of the problems with international relations theory is it assumes that people are basically rational. And Putin is rational in his own rationality, which prizes completely different things. He doesn't want to make Russia more prosperous. He doesn't want to make Russia more popular. He doesn't worry about raising the standard of living over time. He doesn't worry about building infrastructure. He doesn't worry about any of the things that Liz Trust supposedly worries about. Um, he worries about his own stuff, staying in power, making, stealing lots and lots of money and rattling that kind of jingoistic drum. So that's what, that's what we're dealing with. And I wish we were a bit more clear-sighted about it. Wow. Well, can I firstly thank all of you for coming this evening. Uh, 
I, I really feel you've all been very engaged. I'm just watching you here. I can tell, Stuart, you perhaps can't see the crowd, but it's uh, very engaged in the conversation. So thank you for coming. An enormous thank you to you two, to Edward and to Stuart. Uh, I think we'll all agree that you gave tremendous answers to the questions. You've illuminated the question. It's helped our understanding. So can I just thank you for giving your time this evening to ensure that we've had such an interesting event. And finally, can I urge you to come to our events in the future? We've got a couple of our leaflets around. This is the leaflet of the Baltic Geopolitics Programme. We were principally operating online in the period of COVID, and we still have a number of online events. But we also have in-person events, and we want to be able to get that to go as well. And if you have a large amount of money and you'd like to donate it to the programme, have a look at that leaflet uh, to endow a chair. Uh, people are talking about the Lenart Merry Chair, actually, of Baltic Studies I'll, to have I'll here. Donate. You'll donate. Very good. So thank you all for coming. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.